All right, let's talk about units, unit design. And we're gonna talk about unit design in the context of creating a deep and diverse cast. I think very often in the fire community, we get really focused on how the units we design and how the units we give the player are different and quote unquote well balanced. And especially in the context of units that fill similar roles or have the same class or wield the same weapons join at the same time how do i make the choices matter how do i make them different how do i avoid situations where one unit is completely outclassed by the other and i'll tell you this it's hard and balance is impossible it's worth striving for but it's impossible so don't sweat it too much so today we're going to talk about some unit design and the different philosophies that you can approach, take to approach how you design your cast. I think different Fire Emblems will use different types of design philosophies to both design their casts and differentiate their units. And I think for you as a hack creator, you can think, okay, how do I take the best elements of each that I really enjoy and that I think will make a fun game? So let's talk a little bit more about that. Dawson Xavier, great example. All right. So what are our learning objectives today? Articulate how to make units unique in nuanced ways. And the reason I specify nuanced is that I think sometimes we can create units that feel like puzzle pieces and give them and give the player situations where it's like, hey, this is the guy who's weak to this weapon. Use the unit that has the weapon. And if you don't have that unit, you're kind of screwed. And it's not very nuanced. It's what I like to call mac and cheese unit design. I'm more of a fan of French food unit design. French food unit design is subtle, it's nuanced. You taste the different notes in the bechamel, just in the dish. There's just multiple flavors and notes going on and it's all subtle. Versus mac and cheese, it's like, it's cheese. You know it's cheese. It's gonna be good for this one thing, it's cheese. So, I'm thinking, how do we make things unique in a nuanced way? I don't hate mac and cheese, by the way, but it's just how I, it's just very strong flavor, and I like the more nuanced flavors. And I think your cast should have a nuanced flavor, too. Second, model your own units against criteria to better articulate their niches, or niches, depending on your preference. And so we'll have a, we'll put together a bit of a visual framework. It's not a particularly strong visual framework, but it is a framework for you, for you to consider. Uh, how are these units performing across these different dimensions? And the main purpose of that is to determine is every unit I'm adding providing access into a niche compared to others that are doing something similar? And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And then lastly, create a diverse and deep cast of characters for your hack. I think, and this is my opinion, I think that having a large cast that is diverse and that offers you both coverage, should you have units that die, but also have each of them offer something unique on their own, some unique combination of seasonings that help make them worthwhile and interesting and a little bit different than whoever they're replacing. And again, I just want to clarify truths here to remind us once more, my opinion may be bad, I'm not here to preach the gospel. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you how to do it. What I am here to do is share what I've learned from my experience, start a discussion, provide us with language and vocabulary as a vehicle for that discussion around how we balance units. And that's not, a, and that's not to say there's never a place for mac and cheese in your menu. You can always have some mac and cheese units. But I think your overarching cash would probably feel more like a French restaurant. That's my that's my shtick. But yeah, my opinion may be bad. I apologize if you disagree. I don't mean to offend you. But this is how I feel about things. And I hope it helps. I hope it helps you create something cool. So first let's talk about your design philosophies through the ages. I've put I've looked at every single vanilla fire emblem game. Except for BSFE, because I've never played it. Sorry, Smee. And 
I've categorized it into these different types of unit design philosophies in a little bit of what makes them distinct. Now, it's impossible to perfectly categorize each, but you should kind of know what I'm talking about if you've played most of these. The first being Fire Emblem 1 style, which is also seen in FE3, FE6, and of course FE11 and FE12. And this is, like, you know, to me this is like the most traditional style of Fire Emblem. It's a large cast. It bit, like, these games have like, probably some of the largest casts across all the games. This might be like the games with the biggest casts overall. The large cast, multiple units joined at the same time that are essentially copies. I bet on the right you couldn't tell who was cored and who was bored. Right? How do you differentiate the two of them? They're basically the same thing. One has C rank, one has E rank. One has a slightly better speed growth. Right? It's very, very subtle. They're essentially copies. Obviously, they're going to use Barst anyway. Uh, another thing about this type of unit design philosophy is that late joiners are usually subpar replacements for earlier units. I think the general thought process of this type of design is like, the first unit you get in a class is probably going to be the best unit you get in that class, and if they die, well, here's a crappier replacement that you can train up to try and get back to where you were. So it's a little bit like death is punishment, but you still have some wiggle room. And then the niche is generally at the class level. So what I mean by this is that the biggest differentiators between units are usually occurring at the class itself. Like. The differences between Cord and Board and Barst are really just like their stats. What like none of them are gonna like outperform each other in these like other ways except like these very, very minor, very hard to imagine situations. The niche is generally gonna be at the class level. I would say other games and as you'll see, classes will be a little bit more differentiated, but you can generally look at like the casts of FE1, FE6, FE3 and basically like determine who you're going to use based on their class because the units kind of follow a similar stat spread and structure in their class. So I like this type of unit design. I kind of wish Fire Emblem would go a little bit more back towards that. I could see some people not liking it because it leans towards units as kind of like being really generic and replaceable, which I'm not totally against personally, but I think we can do better in, you know, do board and cord need to be like that similar? Can we make them a little bit more differentiated so that they both feel like different units versus just like carbon copies? Dolphin McCallum. Do they need to be exactly the same and also worse than Doga? So just like consider these things. Then we got guide and design, FE2, FE15. I think also FE4 kind of falls into this group and this is really around like a smaller and more distinct cast and the differentiation of the units isn't so much about the classes but more about their spell lists items and skills spell lists in the context of guidance skills in the context of fe4 and so in, the, in this game generally you're probably going to use almost every unit that's given to you at least for some period of time beyond like when they join the games aren't necessarily as Iron Man friendly, and it's very unit focused design. The design of each of these units, it's almost like they looked at each unit and were like, okay, how do we make this unit feel more like a traditional RPG type of character with the items that they come with, what they can hold, right? Like guiding, you only get one inventory slot, so like the item you hold makes a big difference. Similarly, FE4 with the pawn shop, there's a lot of different items you'll want to hold on to, things you pass down, certain skill books and things that you get and pass down or whatever. It's very unit focused design. Every unit is meant to feel really distinct. My issue with this design is that it makes it, un it's just not very armor friendly because it is really small and distinct. And when you expect the player to be using just every unit, it can be um, a little tough to make I think as balanced as it could be, or at least like as interesting on repeat playthroughs, in my opinion. Um, but there are definitely some merits and some good lessons to take away from these types of games as far as how to customize units, how to make them feel a little bit more distinct against others who fill similar roles. And we'll actually use a guide and example later on, but just brush it through here. Then we have what I like to call FE7 design, and this is really kind of FE7, FE8, FE9, FE10. These are medium large size casts. And unlike FE1 style, where 
Your late joiners are almost strictly outclassed by the early joiners. The late joiners are generally the crutch characters. Usually, you know, I think the, the discourse might be, why am I bothering to use Urk when I get Pent, who's going to be way better? And the philosophy here is, like, you have units to help you get through certain parts of the game, and then you get new units to help you get through the next part of the game. And the differentiation between these units is largely by stat spread and join time. So, like, you look at, like, we'll go back to mages and FE7. How you compare Urk, Pent, and Nino? I mean, Urk you have for a lot longer, but Pent's going to outclass him at the period you have both of them. And Nino's just kind of bad. Um... For Cavaliers, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The stat spread makes a big difference, as well as the join time. So these games generally have like two to three units in each like general class, or that fills specific kinds of roles. And then what makes each of them different and interesting is when they join and the stat spread. And I'd say this is true of these three games specific, or these four games specifically. FE 10's a little bit of an outlier, but I think the late joiners as strong crutch character is really, really key. I think these games make their end games palatable by having the strong Godo units um, and just other types of strong pre-promotes towards the end. But these games generally a little bit more Iron Man friendly than the FE2 style games. A little less differentiation, more differentiation than FE1 style for sure. Like I think Harkin and Raven kind of play very differently. They use them kind of differently. They have different pros and cons. Um, I'm trying to think of others off the top of my head. Even like Loan and Marcus, right? I think are quite different. Loan and Isadora, I think, is an interesting comparison to make, um, and how you would use each of those units in the game and how you would feel about them. So, the differentiation largely by stats for enjoy time. I think in this case, there's less being strictly outclassed. It still happens. Don't get me wrong, and we can talk about those examples ad nauseum. But I'd say these this cast design. Still Iron Man friendly, but I think it could also leave a bad taste in the player's mouth of like, man, like I've been raining, training Raven forever and Harkin's just way better. Or I really wanted to use Dart and then Hawkeye's way better. Uh, and it could kind of feel stinky. I was using Loot and Soleil's way better, etc, etc, etc. The list goes on. Then we got the modern FEs. FE 13, 14, and 16. These are again medium, small size casts. And the skill supports and weapon ranks are really key. And a big reason why these are important stats for differentiating units is because of how heavily focused these games are on reclassing and customization. Awakening and Fates, you get six skill slots each. Three houses, you get a bunch. You can customize and mix and match by like going up different um, classes. And here's the kicker. It's really customizable at the unit level versus the army level. So, it's less so about do I use, you know, Raphael or Ignatz, it's do I make Raphael into an armor knight or a fighter? And do I make Ignatz the other one, right? It's a little bit more, it's like I have this, this like blank slate of a unit, of a unit, and I get to choose which direction they go in versus like making a choice between two units that have already kind of a pre-packaged distinctness. It's a very different philosophical change in Fire Emblem. I think, in the context of ROM hacking, I don't think this works very well because it's just a lot of, there's a lot to do. I think you can make it work. I know the Tale of Turn in ASM that Curb made that you lets you pick like different classes for units up front is pretty cool. I think you can design some fun gimmicks around that. Should you want to use that, it's still publicly available. I don't think anyone's used it yet. But this type of Fire Emblem generally means you have a smaller cast, and to me, if everything's really customizable and it's easy to customize, everything kind of optimizes towards the same path, especially in games where it can get a little bit more challenging. So, some good lessons here, again, similar to like the guide and style design, where you can learn how to differentiate units and make them each feel more distinct. But I think there's also a point where you have to consider, you know, we're making Fire Emblem in the GBA, there's certain limitations to how these games can customize versus how those old games can customize. And so, how do I how do I take the best of both here? And the one game that you might have noticed is conspicuously absent, because I think it kind of stands apart, is Thracia. I think Thracia unit design is probably the best overall. I think Thracia, from like a pure gameplay standpoint, probably has the best cast. 
at least in terms of my own biases and preferences, and maybe it's because I do like Thracia a lot. But as a medium to large sized cast, like comfortable for Iron Man. It has a diverse cast with a mix of growth units and strong pre-promotes, so I'd say, you know, late joiners don't strictly outclass early joiners and vice versa. There's a mix. Units you get can play both like these good growth units and also these good pre-promotes. I feel like I very rarely get someone who joins that's like completely outclassed by someone else or vice versa. There's always like some type of trade-off or nuance difference between the different units that I really like. And the differentiation here comes across a number of factors. Skill, support, joint type, stats, etc. How I think about these different units. Um, there's usually some type of pro and con to using one over the other as an overall package. In specific roles it becomes a little bit different, but like as an overall package of a unit and what they offer, there's usually like something that each unit can do that their peer or next best replacement cannot. And that I think is an important consideration. We've talked a little bit about the unit designs of, of casts and kind of how they, they function generally, and there are good lessons from each of these and things that you should incorporate into your own, and I would encourage you to kind of create your own unit design philosophy as you're building your game and thinking through kind of how you want the cast to be differentiated or how you want the game to play. Really important. So let's talk a little bit. Let's, what I've done is I've distilled these tenets for unit design and combining the best elements of each of these. I have Neem here on the screen because I think Neem is one of the best designed units the game's ever made. Not only Old Lady Dark Mage, but also really cool utility staffer. Can do things that no other units can, but also has very clear drawbacks. It's really like well designed and fun unit. So Lucas is here to tell us about some unit design tenets. And the first being Every unit should be viable. I really dislike when people are like, oh, this unit has to be bad. Like, I'm making the intentionally bad unit. It's like, why? You're just wasting your time and the player's time. Every unit should be viable. And what I mean by viable is that they should be useful either immediately or with some investment and it gets payoff. There should be... The unit should be able to compete and be serviceable in the context of the game in some meaningful way, whether that's combat or utility, we'll talk about those different dimensions later. But something like that I think can be really key. Every unit with a similar role should not be strictly outclassed in all dimensions. So I think to help make casts more interesting and compelling, if you have units that are filling similar roles, how are they differentiated? I think it can be really stinky when you get a unit that is just co completely worse than another unit you've already had in every meaningful dimension and they have like no distinct niche or upper hand against their next best replacement. I think like a good example could be something like you have two cavaliers, one who joins earlier that's really like strength and defense focused and another one who's like really good at resistance. Or something, and like you have this new niche of like, oh, this this cavalier is actually really good at killing certain mage bosses, and then the other cavalier can't really do that as well. And it's a niche, but it's differentiation. It's a reason to consider using them, even if like a role is crowded. So like not being strictly outclassed in every dimension, really key. If the other unit's just like worse bases, worse growths, worse availability, worse ranks, it's kind of like, well, dude, like, why are you here? Besides just like being actually backup and is there payoff for using you. So not being strictly a class in every dimension, really important. Here's an important one. One you should be the only answer to a problem, total uniqueness is limiting. This goes back to puzzle piece design. If I lose a unit that is my only answer to a challenge that you as the designer have put forth, that's bad design bad. You gotta let the player play past their mistakes and you need to provide some degree of coverage to a player should they lose out, right? So for example I think FE6 is kind of bad about this early on where it's like, if you don't have Rutger hitting bosses on the throne are just awful. Um, I'm trying to think of like a very specific example where if you're missing a specific unit, you just like can't win or progress. I don't know any off the top of my head, 
it's very extreme. I don't think very many hacks do this. But the point still stands that like you shouldn't assume that the player is going to have the one solution to the one problem. You should try and think, okay, this unit can be best dealing with this problem. But I should also design it in such a way that other units can deal with it, albeit less optimally. Or maybe it's not the best thing this other unit can be doing. You gotta provide flexibility, because otherwise if it's like, okay, I play you know, with this one unit, I put them in this one spot and I win, it becomes a puzzle. And that's really not very fun, um, in my opinion. I'm not really crazy on puzzly style fire emblems. So ensuring that, yes, like a unit can have like a distinct advantage against a certain enemy type or a certain situation, but you should make it so that they're the only answer to that. All right, like I'll use my own work as an example, which I don't really like to do, but it came to mind. In Vision Quest, early on, I give Larissa, your armor knight, a horse slayer, and she's probably your best option in 1-6 for quickly defeating Cavaliers because she can normal mode she can pretty close to near one shot with the horse slayer. If you don't have Larissa you have other options because you have a Zimbado which can also fight horses. You have Storch with the Catsbogger that can also fight horses albeit they're usually going to be at weapon triangle disadvantage so it's less good but it's still viable. You can still win is my point. One answer is better, but it's not the only answer. So that that's what I mean here. It's like, there can be a clear best solution, but it can't be the only solution. Here's another good one. Having depth in each niche is good, so long as I don't share too many niches with the same unit. And what I mean by depth is kind of like, you know, if you're playing baseball, you talk about your depth chart. How many players do you have that can fill the same role on defense? How many first basemen are on your roster? How many left fielders are on your roster? How deep is your bullpen? Do you have talent to fill these different roles as backups? And when I think about depth in the context of Fire Emblem, I'm thinking specific niches or specific roles or use cases that these units can perform. And it's good to have depth. Now the difference here is that if you're thinking about like these different distilled roles you want to make sure that not the same two units occupy each of the same ones because then one will be probably better than the other so going back to like this hypothetical cavalier example you have two cavaliers okay they both have cavalier utility they both have high movement they both have the same weapon ranks but where are they going to be different okay one is really good at killing mages and the other is better at tanking. So those are like two distinct niches, right? And you could make the argument, well, it's like, well, damn, the, there's gonna be fewer magic. It's like, yeah, I know, One, niches are not created equal. But the point is that you don't wanna put units that are going to like play exactly the same role and just perform as well or really worse than their next best replacement. You want them to have some type of distinct twist that makes them a little bit more differentiated in their own way, even if kind of minor. And most importantly, the quality of the niche depends on what the game demands of the player. Certain roles, certain utility, certain types of units are going to perform better in specific games. There are certain things that we can take as general tenets, like yeah, high movement's probably going to be really good, but there are certain games where axes are good and certain games where axes are bad. I think bows. A really good example. Having bow utility in FE7 American version with 2x effectiveness is really stinky compared to having bow axis in FE6 where it's times three and there's a ton of wyverns to shoot at that are scary. Similarly, having bows in Thracia probably not necessarily as good because of capture and having capture is really important. Um, so again, can't keep think these different things. You know, ideally you want to think like which niches are going to be good. Does every niche have a clear purpose that the player would want to invest in having a unit that fills this type of niche or role? And that's going to depend on you, the designer, to design challenges that reward that. Is flight valuable? Well, it depends a lot more on the type of maps that you design. Flight's going to be really valuable if your entire game takes place in a desert. 
Cavaliers will probably be less valuable. I don't care about horse movement when everything's covered in sand. Again, extreme examples, but it should help illustrate what I mean here. And remember, Seth's here to remind us, perfect balance is impossible. You're not going to be able to create something where it's like the choice is so 50-50 that we can debate it ad nauseum forever and ever and ever. It's not gonna happen. There will be choices that are better. Tier lists will exist. Some units will be better than other units that do similar things. The point is to make it so that the one unit that's really good doesn't render the other unit completely useless in all meaningful dimensions. Like I think in FE8 example, I think like do Ford and Franz offer you things that Seth can't really do as well? I can't think of anything, but if you could think of something, how would you design accordingly if you had a unit like Seth that was very good at what those other units like want to do? What other niches could those units fill? And that could be through a couple different dimensions which we'll talk about in just a bit. So we'll talk about those unit dif differentiation and the different dimensions that I like to think about as I'm designing my own units. What dimensions do I want them to be strong in and so forth? And how am I evaluating to see like, do they have specific niches or advantages over other units in small, but occasionally meaningful ways? So here's my list. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are probably like the main things that I consider when I'm looking at units and evaluating. First being joint time and availability. I think this is really important because you want to have units that have some time to shine, right? Like spreading out when units join means that like, okay, this is your unit for the early game that's going to be good at this thing. And then maybe this other unit will come in later that's in the same class or does the same thing that might be better. But at least you had the early game for this one unit. Um, and availability I think is really key to ensuring that you have units that can fill roles at least at a baseline level at different stretches of the game. Um, but it's also just important to consider to make sure that you're not like front loading or back loading too much of a unit that's in a specific role that you might need. Like Road to Ruin, for example, really backload staff users and there's like more than you'd probably need to use. If they were spread out a little bit more, I'd probably have used each of them a bit more, for example. Next level, and this is inclusive of bases and growths. You know, some units might have bases that allow them to do certain things immediately. Some units have growths that mean that they'll be really worthwhile later on. Looking at this and saying, okay, this unit might not be great now, but there's a lot of payoff to using them later in these dimensions, and that'll allow them to do X, Y, and Z. That can be pretty interesting to balance around. Similarly, stat spread. I think this is a really obvious one to differentiate. You know, this is the, you know, I think the, the Cain and Abel's of the world, right? This one's the speed cav, and this is the strength cav, and that's how they're different. Um, and that can continue on and on with all these other different types of units that kind of fill similar roles or do similar things. Like having the tanky mage versus the fast mage versus, you know, the mage with this specific weapon, yada yada. Speaking of weapons, weapon ranks and weapon access also an interesting way. A little bit more of a subtle way, but like for example, okay, I want a unit that's good at tanking. Okay, I have my armor knight who probably has lances and I'll give him B rank so he can use the brave lance at base. That's pretty distinct and he's good at tanking. I might have my cavalier who's good at tanking and the cavalier also has swords which gives them a little bit more diversity but also good at tanking. Um, maybe lower lance rank so they can't use the brave lance giving the armor knight a distinct niche. Maybe I also have a fighter who has an unusually high defensive score that has access to the hand axe which is a really good weapon because you fight a lot of soldiers in these chapters etc etc so you see like what i'm saying here i'm looking at the specific role which is taking frontline hits and thinking about how each of these units do that slightly differently and weapon ranks and weapon access is one mention to consider along with these others utility utility is really broad i look at utility in a number of different ways there's things like being a mount flight, rescuing, capturing, I would argue staves are utility more so than they are weapon ranks because of, you know, they're not really combat oriented. Um, sometimes I'll use the term bow utility, right, if it's like filling in some type of niche. 
Utility is like this really broad concept of like, what are these things that they can do generally outside of combat that help them be differentiated or make up usually for like less than stellar combat. Yeah, they're not the best fighting, but they can do these other things really well. And some of these other things are things like supports. You know, sometimes you might have a unit that's like, okay, this unit's not as good as this other unit, but he has a really good affinity, and he supports these other units that you're definitely using, and it's going to make that that much better. This other unit now becomes much more compelling as a result. I think supports can be really interesting for balancing units. Okay, this unit's really strong, but its affinity is kind of stinky, and they don't have very many good partners. But this unit, who has less good combat and worse availability, has really excellent support partners and really excellent affinity that help make everyone better. Will that be enough to make them better than the strong unit? Maybe. At least in some contexts, perhaps. And that's good enough. Skills, everyone's favorite. Skills are a very common way in GBA now with the skill system to differentiate. It's certainly an option, something to consider. Similarly, PRF weapons can be a good way to differentiate units. Um, immediately as well. I like giving PRF units usually once once I've kind of play test and realize okay this unit needs a little bit of a buff but giving them a stat buff would be too good so I'll give them a PRF weapon so they can carry a little bit during the time that you first get them and get them rolling a bit. I think PRF weapons are really good for that. Um, also just as like fun rewards to help other units stand out a bit and give them a bit more of a niche or an edge. Um, Kind of similar to skills, but at least it's a limited resource, so I do like PRF weapons a bit more in that way. But again, all different dimensions here for you to consider when differentiating your units. And now let's talk about how we visualize those differences. Wilt's here to help us out. So what's my visual model for assessing units? I generally like to look at units across each of these dimensions to draw comparisons. Now, if I had time and artistic talent, I would create a series of Venn diagrams to articulate this to show like the overlapping niches. I didn't, so we're just gonna look at a list and I'll talk through it. But in this section, I've analyzed units across class, weapon type, utility, and joint time in these different games in these vanilla contexts. And the reason I'm doing it this way is to kind of show where there are opportunities to see like are some units distinct enough? Are some units being strictly outclassed? Because this provides me with the information, okay, I need to do something to this unit to make them distinct. What can I do? And everything's laid out in front of me. This is an exercise I did a lot in Vision Quest to help make units a little bit more distinct. Um, again, I also was of the mind that for my own work, I didn't want units to feel like irreplaceable, but I wanted them to have at least like some small nuanced niches you know I'd say like my design probably straddled somewhere between like the FE1 and the FE5 style overall but it depends on your viewpoint and what you like so this was helpful for me it might be helpful for you so let's look at class and I know there's a lot of text here so bear with me FE6 Cavaliers and Paladins so we're looking at units at the class level this is probably the most common way to compare units and it's understandable I mean look they have the same sprites basically people generally like to think like okay I can only use X unit from each class I don't know why but people generally kind of make that very natural comparison of units in a class and how they perform I don't think this is the best way to look at a unit but it's certainly a way to look at a unit and let's compare a little bit here you got Marcus Marcus has the best luck in res of the Cavs early on. I think that's really useful, especially against some of the mages. He requires no investment. He's triangle axis. Marcus is great. Um, no investment. Alan and Lance, they're really similar. The biggest difference is that Alan's a little bit better in strength and Lance is a little bit better than speed, but they're practically the same. It's hard to really differentiate them. They both have fast supports. I'd argue that Lance's supports are better because Lance supports a lot and they get to play chess, which is better than whatever Alan and Wade talk about. Um, but they're pretty much the same. If I was going back and redesigning FE6, I might think, what can I do to make them a little bit more distinguished? There's a couple things, but I'll let you decide. Then we got, I think this is where it gets a little more interesting. Then we got our mid-joiners here. So they join in like chapter seven. So you've already had like seven chapters of these first three units. So these units are coming in. How are they competing? 
Well, Noah's got C rank swords, which is kind of niche. That might be higher than what you would have with Alan or Lance if you've been using them, because I think one of them comes with E rank and the other comes with D rank, and they're both probably going to be using Lance's a bit as well. So, C rank on a cav could be unique. They have enough con for steel swords without AS loss. That's a niche. Again, very small niche. Very, very small, but it's something. Track offers you really, like, a better defense base than Noah and probably better defense than Alan and Lance, but, like, he offers really you nothing. He's got some supports, but none of them are really fast or that good. I don't think his affinity is anything special. His supports are very well written, but that's not a gameplay thing. So, Track is one of those units that I was alluding to earlier where it's like, he just gets outclassed by his peers, right? Marcus will be better than him for most of the time that you have him. Lance, Alan, Noah probably are going to be better than Trek, both out of the gate and long term. Trek really doesn't serve much purpose besides, hey, you want another Cavalier, which isn't spectacular. If I was redesigning FE6 and making my epic FE6 rebalance, I would probably rework Trek in a very big way to make him more distinct. And then Jero, it's just kind of like second Marcus, mid-join. And what I think makes Jero most useful is that he's got good weapon ranks. If you're like me and forget to grind Marcus's axe rank, Jero has the niche of being able to use the hammer and halberd at base, which are really useful in this game. He's got A rank lances, also very useful. So that's a bit of a niche for him. And just like being generally good at combat with no investment. Solid unit. And then we got Percival, late join who helps you really carry through the late game. No investment, strong bases, good weapon ranks. Um, this is a really solid combatant. Will generally gel in nicely with any other army that you've developed at this point. Uh, so what I might do with this list, looking at it now, I've played the game. I've des I'm designing FE6. Kaga left, and I'm a little lost. I might look at this list and say, okay, are these units differentiated enough for their purposes? and do I want to make them more unique? Generally, I think you probably do, because I look at this list and I'm like, the niches that Noah has over Lance and Allen, despite joining seven chapters later, not really that spectacular. Trek, obviously, much worse. Jero is just like second Marcus, which again, depth chart in a niche, or in a role, it's fine. Like, I think most people would say like, yes, I'll take two paladins. I'll gladly have a second paladin. But I look at No and Trek and I'm like, okay, if I was redesigning them, how would I make it so that they have some type of advantage over Lance and Allen, who have the early join, they probably have some supports going, if their growths are hitting, they're doing well. I mean, yeah, you might argue that No and Trek could be replacements, but I think the likelihood of Lance and Allen being worse than them upon join is pretty unlikely if you're investing in them at all. So what can I do with these two units to make them more distinct? And there's a couple of things you could consider. Stat spread, weapon ranks, affinity, support, giving them a PRF weapon, etc. Different ways to differentiate. I probably wouldn't worry about Percival because he's already quite functional and would fit into your army regardless, but these other units like No and Trek where it's like, why would I use them over Lance and Allen? And that's the critical question. Why would I use them over these other units? Like, yeah, like I might use them over Marcus because Long term, no will probably be better. Long term, Trek will probably be better. But compared to Lance and Alan, who already have a head start and are kind of similar in growth and stats and probably going to be higher level at this point, what are these two offering you? C rank swords, enough con for steel swords, probably not enough. So, my framework here that I'm thinking about this, it's a good little mental exercise. What would you do to make like Trek and Noah stand out a little bit more or to give them a niche over Lance and Alan? Oops, wrong way. I also did by weapon type. I liked looking at weapon type a bit more. I generally like looking at like weapon type, like infantry or weapon type mount because it like balances out for those different things. And this is not an exhaustive list of FE7 sword users, but kind of the same sort of exercise that we do here with these different sword users and the different utility that each of them offer across their class. And this becomes a little bit more about like what utility does their class have, what um, distinct aspects about how they use the weapon will be different. And the reason that I look at it this way is because when we're thinking about weapon types, you know, you probably don't want your army to be 
12 sword users, but you probably want like two or three. Because not because if you have good swords to use, one unit can't use all of them each turn. So you want to have multiple units using them. There's probably going to be multiple axe classes to beat up. So having multiple sword users is good, and that might cut across classes. So looking at this can help you say, okay, if I want a sword user, what are the benefits of using one unit over the other? And we got Eliwood, obviously, force deploy. He's got a prof weapon, fast supports. This type of utility, quite interesting. Really fast support with Hector, who's also force deployed. The rapier, especially in the Japan version with times three effectiveness, is quite good. Um, even if he's kind of middling elsewhere, you're kind of stuck with him, so you don't really pay a cost to use him that much. Matthew, early join, high speed, thief utility. Not going to be your best combatant, but he does have fast speed and he can be used for thieving, so like making him like into a sword fighting unit. Probably not a terrible, terrible idea in some contexts. Marcus, of course, he's got a mount, requires no investment, he's a paladin, he has a lot of access to other things. Like, It's hard to even think of Marcus as a sword unit because he can do so many other things, but he can use swords. So it's worth keeping him as part of this conversation. But that's also like a point in these other units' favor. It's like, yeah, Marcus can use swords, but is that the best use of Marcus? And like, if I have a killing edge, do I want to give it to Marcus or should I give it to Guy? He gets crit boost on promo, who has C rank swords. He's got high skill and speed. You know, Guy is probably going to be the most skillful and speedy of your sword units, besides like Marcus. And Marcus can't use every sword. Marcus has probably also wanted to use some lances and axes. So Guy has a little bit of an edge there. Raven gets axes on promo, which is an important niche, that 1 2 range. He's got strong bases and growths, good out of the box, good supports. Lucius and Priscilla. I'd say Raven generally outclasses Guy. You know, yes, Guy has these niches of like, okay, he's got like the C rank swords, he's got crit boost on promo, but like, context, hand axes are going to be way better. And the difference between their stats isn't so great where um, Guy's combat is going to be meaningfully different than Guy, or Guy's combat is going to be different than Raven. So I kind of want the hand axe. So I might prioritize Raven over Guy if all other things hold steady. But you can see there's some pros and cons. And those types of challenges are really interesting. What falls flat in FE7 is the way the enemies are designed, making a unit like Guy a lot less valuable. In a different game, we might be saying Guy is great, Raven's trash. Context really matters. You gotta look at this and know the context. That's why I did vanilla, because I knew we'd all know the context. Loan, also a sword unit. Mount utility. He's probably your best defensive sword unit, besides Marcus. He also gets lands and axes on promo, and he has all the other trappings of being a mount, which are nice. It may be worth thinking of Loan as like, okay, I want Loan to have a good sword rank to fight these brigands and use the early killing edge to do funny things. It's an idea. Lin, kind of a mid-joiner. She has Lin mode access for leveling up. She gets bows on promo, force deployed in the Manicotti, which is nice. So again, lower cost of using her because she is force deployed in certain areas and the Manicotti is a pretty good weapon. So there's some, some niche for her there as a sword unit. And then Harkin, late join, no investment, just solid all around. It's like, why would you not use Harkin? Got a crutch carry you through. So again, looking at this list, knowing FE7, there's probably some things you would tweak to make each of these units stand out a little bit more in their respective areas or to give them a bit of an advantage. I'd say like the biggest case here is like, Guy is probably the most strictly outclassed. Maybe Matthew as well, but Matthew has thief utility, so it doesn't really matter as much. But like, I look at Guy, I look at Lin. These are probably the two units who I'm like, okay, these are units that I probably cannot use and not really lose out on much. So what can I do to make them a bit more distinct and better? or give them an edge over these units like Raven or Loen or Marcus who like have so much extra utility that they bring to the table that they might actually compete in this dimension of being a good sword unit. Different ways to think about it. stats, supports, prof weapons, right? What are the different levers we can pull? So that's that. By utility. So I have staves listed as utility here because it's not really a weapon. I get that it's weapon rank, but I think if stays is like you have utility, it allows you to do these other things that most units can't. And I think this is a good example of like making the cast kind of well balanced across the group. Like there's a reason to deploy each of these staff units in the game. And we're going to talk about why. Safi. 
One, she's your first staffer. She has the repair staff, which is her PRF. She gets light magic on promo. Uh, you can get her to A rank probably faster than most of these other units because she is there for the because root availability. So she has a niche. She can be useful now and later. Really good unit. Nana, early join as well. She has a monopoly on being your staff unit through Manster, which is an important niche. She has a mount. She has swords, including the Earth Sword, which gives her a unique niche as well, worth deploying for other things outside of just staffing. And she has charm, which is also really useful. So while her staff rank might not be as good as Staffy, 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 Nana has these other things that, yes, you can use her as a healer, and she brings these other things to the table, but Staffy's probably going to be better purely from a healing perspective. Tina, probably the weakest here, but she does have the Thief Staff, which has some niche uses, which would make you want to deploy her and get her skill up enough so that she doesn't miss, which is kind of a silly thing to think about. Saloof, mid to late joiner. He has no investment and comes with A-rank staves. Free Warper, which is kind of nice at this point in the game. Is he going to be better than Safi or Nana? Probably not overall because he has less availability, but he's a free Warper, which can be nice. And there are certain niches where you'd want to have multiple Warpers on the map and not having to grind his staff rank up can be effective. And then lastly, said late joiner, obviously for Seti, a really strong combat. He can use staves, it's not his primary focus, but he's got for Seti, which makes him worth fielding anyway. So he's got really good combat. So all these units, like, they offer you something different, but not none of them are, like, distinctly irreplaceable. Like, losing Tina and the Thief Staff, in, like, an LTC context might stink, but in a general casual context, it doesn't really matter that much. Losing any of these one units in a casual context doesn't really matter that much, but having them is really nice, and again, and they do have some distinct advantages over their peers, while also some distinct disadvantages. And I think like this is like a very well balanced and good um, example of like what I mean by like the Thracia style design. Now let's look at join time. So another another lens to look at units by is when they join, because we're naturally going to compare units during the times with which they join us. Similar to how we compare by class, or by what weapon they use, or the utility they offer, we're also going to look at... Okay, these units, they all join in like the first section of the game. How do I feel about that? If I'm doing a tier list of all Celica Act 2 units, how would I do that? So these are all the units that join in Celica Act 2, one of my favorite arcs in all Fire Emblem. It's just really fun. I could play this one over and over again. And you have a. I'm not gonna for the in the interest of time. I'm not gonna go through all this super in depth. Well, uh, you can see here just by looking through. There are units that are similar, but they have different edges. Like Bowie and May. Common comparison: May has better speed, so she's doubling more often. Bowie has slightly better bulk, so he can take more hits. In Gaiden, I think generally the speed matters a bit more, so Bowie kind of falls a bit flat, unfortunately. And his spell list isn't so differentiated from Maze that he gets a niche there. If I was rebalancing, I'd probably give Bowie access to some better spells earlier to make up for his lackluster speed. Because Maze's damage output is going to be so much higher. Um, so that's something to consider. Then we got like another similar area here, like Saber and Kamui. Like I'd say Saber pretty much outclasses Kamui, but the niche of using swords and being a dread fighter is so good anyway. It hardly matters. Right? Like, if. Kamui was like weaker Valbar, I might say, okay, we need to do something here. Do I need two Valbars in Celic Act 2? I mean, sure, but I'd rather have two Sabres. <laughs> right? So, even if, again, it goes back to like depth in the niche, I don't mind that Kamui doesn't really offer too much over Saber because I have to use him anyway, and being a mercenary is still really good. There's probably some things I could do to make Kamui stand out from Saber. Maybe I'd give him better res, or a prof weapon, or supports, or something to like make him have some type of niche or edge. But on its on its face here, they're all forced to play it anyway, and Kamui is still worth giving kills to. So different different niches here. And again, I just love laying it out because it helps me think through how do I ensure that every unit is worth using in some degree. 
We all know Celica is probably the best. Saber is obviously very good. Jenny, you're gonna want to take to late game for invoke and all that kind of stuff. But are these other units who we know aren't as strong still worth using? Like Leon is still, you know, having a bow is still nice. All right. Are we ensuring that every unit has some purpose no matter how small? And making it so that their purpose is not to be the only answer to the problem, but to be one, an one of many answers to a problem and perhaps the best answer. So that's my spiel. I hope you enjoyed this video on unit design. I've been kicking around this video for a long time and I finally figured out the right way to articulate it. I hope that I was clear. I hope this has helped you as you think about how you look at your cast and think through like, okay, what kind of game experience do I want? What kind of cast design do I want? And then how do I ensure that I avoid some of the trappings of that style? All right, I think it's very, we, if you're here, you probably look at tier lists and you look at casts a lot and you're thinking about like, man, like what was IS thinking when they added this unit who's just straight up worse? And you might do that too. I've certainly done that. And I think by having, going through this exercise and thinking through and providing the vocabulary and the different and understanding like the light, the levers we can pull to make units distinct beyond just like surface level things like class and level, we can create much more deep, diverse, and compelling casts that can make Fire Emblem games a little bit more interesting and quote unquote well balanced. Again, perfect balance is never possible. It's worth striving for, but don't go crazy. It's okay if some units are better than others, but if they are better than others, are they better in every single dimension or just in the ones that matter the most? And that's the key difference in my opinion. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to see your comments on this and I'll see you next time for something different. Until then, be safe. Thanks for watching.